you and your air guitar. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bowfishing Buzz presented by AMS Bowfishing. My name is Matthew and I'm here with my good buddy, D. Schmitty. How's it going everybody? Welcome back to another AMS Bowfishing Buzz episode 13 now. 13, lucky 13. Yep, yep. Yeah, I think we have a, a cool uh, format for this podcast. Uh, two weeks ago now, we put a post out on social media that episode 13 was going to be totally dependent on our social media following, and we were going to answer some questions that you guys asked us. We're going to yep. discuss them, and that's going to be what today's podcast is all about. That's right. That's right. Questions from bowfishing guests, bowfishing customers, bowfishing friends. Absolutely. Yep. If you guys ever, you know, we're going to be doing stuff like this in the future, make sure to follow us on our, our YouTube Facebook, Instagram, you know, we're always posting yep. cool pictures and whatnot, so make sure to follow us there, and I, uh, I think we should get right into it. That's right, and you can also follow these on our AMS YouTube channel. These podcasts. These yep. podcasts, and you can be following along, and we're going to be putting pictures up of the customers that called in or texted us or messaged us or posted on Facebook. Uh, some of your pictures, where we can put some of them up on the background also, so. Absolutely. All right, so first question that was asked for the uh, episode 13 podcast was from Randy Parker. <laughs> on Facebook, and he asks, how many lifelong friends have you met at the boat ramp, at a tournament, or on the water? I personally have met so many friends through boat fishing. It's mind-blowing, all because I bought an AMS Model 310 Retriever <laughs> that is still going strong. That's a pretty cool question right Good there. old Randy FX Parker. <laughs> Great guy. Great guy. And um, you are right on, Randy, when you said that you meet a lot of lifelong memories. Absolutely. Attending boat fishing events, traveling different waters in different states, um, going to tournaments. Some of my best friends are because of bow fishing. Absolutely. Um, I actually met Randy at uh, Archery Camps USA in Indiana. He was there helping out. And um, he came up, we started talking, and we became friends. And ever since then, he has made the trophies yep. for the AMS Big 20, the, his Driftwood trophies that he does. Mm -hmm. um, him and Shot used to make those. Uh, years ago, he used to make uh, bats, and um, Randy's a great guy. Um, I, like I said, some of my best friends are because of bow fishing. Absolutely. Um, you meet them at youth events, tournaments, and you stay connected with them. Oh, for sure. Um, they'll give you a little bit of heads up. Hey, man, you know, the, the water is just right down here. The grass carp are, are back in the bay. is pretty good on the river, and... And um, they give you heads up. Um, we give them heads up and absolutely um, help one another when help's needed, you know, at times like that. One thing I think, you know, our, our previous podcast, episode 12, Dennis Redden. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a prime example of what right. that question's all about right there. Yep. You know, he uh, we're, we're great friends with him. He does a lot of stuff for us. We do a lot of stuff for him. It's a great, you know, two-way relationship. Absolutely. Because of bow fishing, like you said, I have met some of my best friends that I have ever met in my life. Um, a lot of my... High school buddies and buddies that I used to chum around with back here at home. Yep. A lot of them don't bow fish. Right. You know, um, I, one of my classmates does bow fish, and we go up once in a while, very on seldom occasions once in a while. Um, he does come to the tournaments. I see him there. He does come to the youth tournaments. But other than that, none of my friends, you know, that I grew up with are on your bow fish. Right. So the friends that I mean bow fishing are my friends. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's just going off of what you said there. In high school, I started working here in high school. And so, as you can imagine, that's I would talk about work all the time at school. You know, I had all my hunting and fishing buddies that I would talk to, and um, you know, we take them out bow fishing. Yep. And to this day, you know, we're still very close. You know, we, maybe we wouldn't have been as close to friends if we went to gone out bow fishing and we went to had that you know that connection and absolutely. just kind of on a smaller scale as far as you know making mm -hmm. some friends doing that. But yeah, absolutely. absolutely, I think that that's actually a huge benefit of the bow fishing community. We're so tight knit. Yeah. You know, we're we're like one big family, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no doubt about that. Yeah, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, Randy. Next question from Facebook, Dustin Bell. Let's hear about some wintertime bow fishing tactics. That's kind of a tough one there, especially living especially in here. Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Dustin, we do get out here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, we'll go back out on the water here for fall bow fishing. You know, all the way through October. I've got some buddies that will do it as long as the water's still open on the Mississippi River. Sure. You know, um, and it seems like those fish will actually come back into the shallow waters 
when that water starts cooling off, I think when that water turns. Sure. Yep. Turnover. And turnover. Um, the water clears up. The vegetation goes down. Yep. Yep. And those fish, be, you know, and, and it's great bow fishing. Um, one of the biggest buffalo carp that we had ever shot. I was just going to mention that. Yep. Was in October. And it, and it ended up being the the BAA world record big mouth buffalo. Yep. And the Wisconsin Bow Fishing Association um, record buffalo. It was 84 pounds. 84. 84 I, pounds. I remember that I deer hunted that afternoon. <laughs> and I know that you were going out bow fishing. And mm-hmm. I was up at some ungodly hour for some reason. And you called me or you texted yep. me. I had to go run out to the old shop to get you a scale. Get scale. And I remember we met in the Walmart parking lot to weigh that fish. <laughs> at what? Like it was at 3 o'clock in the morning yeah. or 2.30 in the morning? And I remember seeing the fish. I was like, wow, that is a solid, you know, that's a 65, that's a 60 or 65-pound fish. We put that fish on the scale. We all, there's footage of that somewhere. Yeah. When we put it on for the first time and we saw 84 flash up, <sighs> we all kind of, uh, oh, my, yeah. we all kind of lost crazy. it a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Yep. And, in fact, uh, speaking of wintertime bow fishing, I just got done talking to some guides down in Louisiana, and um, this is their season is really getting good right now down there, you know, later in the year like this year. This is when their season really starts taking off down there. Yep. Um, I've had some buddies on the Ohio River that have shot big heads all the way through November. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, they're in Indiana. Um, so, but normally here in Wisconsin, we'll go out till October, till things start freezing over. Um, they kind of put the stuff away, but then we'll get back out there when there's still ice on the main lakes, and we'll get these open spots that have opened up in March. Yep, and that can be some very, very good bow fishing there. Very good bow fishing when that ice starts opening up, where these feeder creeks start opening up into the lakes, and that current starts breaking that ice down. Those fish just flock. Yep, to those areas where there's some fresh oxygen some coming oxygen into there. flowing through there. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Just um, you know to go off of that. When was it when you and me, we went down to a offshore earlier this year? Yep, Castle Rock. Was, that was March? That was February. That was it February? February? Yep. And there was just a little bit of open water, and there were fish in there like crazy. The drum were in there. Yeah. Really yep. Occasional carp here and there, but mainly the drum were in there yep. really thick. Yep. And then in, also in some states, you can shoot northern pike through the ice. Yep. South I've Dakota. Seen that. We can't do that here in Wisconsin, unfortunately. That would be so much fun to try to do that, but... That's another wintertime, yep. you know, activity that you can do with bow fishing, depending on what your state regulations are, of right. course. Getting to what you just said about shooting fish through the ice. Yep. Here in Wisconsin, we can't do that because we're only allowed to drill a certain size hole when yep. we're ice fishing. You can't even drill two holes. I don't think you can even drill two holes right next to you each can't. other. can't. They can't yeah. connect each other. Yep. But there is, they do sturgeon spear here. Yes. In certain areas and certain waters. And there, they're allowed to cut big holes for to spear the sturgeon. Yep. We can't do that for bow fishing, and we're actually talking about trying to to you know make that a a note here for the Wisconsin Bow Fishing Association sure. to allow us to do that because there's some areas we could go. You could drill a you know cut out a big hole with a chainsaw. Yep. And shoot carp pretty pretty good through through the ice. So yeah. That's one thing that we're going to try to get changed here and try to have the the Department of Natural Resources look into. Sure, sure. I, you know, uh, Lake Winnebago is huge for, yeah. right? that's Bagel, right? Where yep. it's, I mean, I've seen like um, TV mm-hmm. shows done, national TV shows done about steering sturgeon on Lake Winnebago. Right. I mean, it's a big, it's a big deal. It is a big and deal. And if you're, you know, cutting holes nice to spear sturgeon, why can't you do it to, to shoot invasive species? I'm all for it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Good question there. This next one's a little bit tricky. It's a very good question though. Mitchell Terry commented on our Facebook post. Is there anything you have noticed as far as weather or barometer or current in the rivers that would indicate whether big head will be up good or if there are times silvers prefer to stay on top versus big heads? That's a good question. Yeah. That's a very good question. No doubt, no doubt does barometric pressure affect rough fish just like it does game fish. Sure. Myself, I like it when it's been a steady pattern for four to five days sure i like that that same barometric pressure the same weather pattern um pressure doesn't affect us because we're used to the pressure yep yep but now you go jump off of a diving board into the water and go down deep what do your ears do right yep yep start they, 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 they pop mm-hmm. it hurts the pressure is doing the same thing to fish all right you know all those little 
I don't know the exact measurements of the barometric pressure, but that's all pushing down on fish in the water. Sure. Yep. And um, I like it when there's a steady barometric pressure. What the barometric pressure does is it makes, it's kind of like gravity in water. You'll get weeds or vegetation or zooplankton or and stuff float sure. or go further down. Yep. yep. I think that plays a key role in big heads for feeding wise. Now that tiny little zooplankton and stuff, they do have tiny little bladders in there that help them with buoyancy. But when there's a sharp change in barometric pressure, it kind of shocks them a little bit. Sure. And all that tiny zooplankton stuff that the big heads feed on will either float or go down lower. Sure. And I really believe that when that barometric pressure, I don't know what the right barometric pressure is. Sure. But when that happens, that's why you see those big heads feeding with their top of their heads right out of the right, water. Right. And you get some of those nights that you could go up and touch them. They're so, yeah. you know, they're so intent on feeding. Absolutely. But then there are some nights when you look at your sonar, you're not seeing no big heads on the surface. But you can see schools of a whole bunch of fish, and I'm assuming that they're big heads. Right, right are down there in four or five feet of water or even lower than that because that's where that that their feet is. Sure, sure. You know? Yep. Um, another thing that really changes the fish, I believe, is cold fronts and dropping water. Sure. I know. I hear you talk about dropping water all the time. I hate dropping water. Yep. It's, it, it pulls fish. It pulls fish out. Um, you have a, a big flooded field that's been flooded for a week now. Water's been going in there, and eventually on the third or fourth day, there's going to be a lot of fish in there if the sure. water's rising. Yep. All right? Once that water starts sucking back out and it starts getting lower, those fish, they don't want to get trapped in there. They're feeling right. that pressure. Right. Right. They're going to come back out and go back in the deep water to escape that from getting trapped in those yep. pockets. Right. Exactly. Yep. Current. Absolutely current makes a big difference. Um, I love finding... I don't think that fish really go crazy when the river is really jacked up and there's a strong current i don't think they like they try to go and look for spots to get away from that a little eddy or It'd just something. be like if you were running for 24 hours straight right all right. the fish is swimming you know for all that time the water is really jacked up and flowing he's gonna go look for a spot where there's a little bit of a break or an right. eddy or something like that to, right. to okay i'm gonna take a break now right. you know behind some structure behind some, some structure right yeah. absolutely and eddies also create a great spot where there's a bunch of debris and 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 scum lines and stuff right. like that sure and big heads like that stuff as well yeah yeah that's very interesting i know from a deer hunting perspective especially late season if your barometric pressure is above i know the magic number a lot of guys say is like 31 30 yeah. ish right around mm-hmm. in there i've seen it firsthand if it's above 30 deer move like crazy and they move early but then if you get a low pressure day movement is not near as good i right. wonder if that same you know, it's got to affect, I you know, the same it. way. Mm-hmm. I, but I wonder if there's like a, a certain, you know, 30 for deer hunting. It's like, oh, it's above 30. You're going to see a lot of deer tonight. I wonder if there is a, right. if you could tie a number to seeing a bunch of fish in a night too. That'd be interesting to tell. Yeah, it would we'll be. have to try to test that. If we're out, we'll have to try to see what the yeah. pressure is and how the fishing that's is. A, that's a good thing to try out. I've never tried it, but I would like to try that. Um, but man, big heads to me are as finicky as they come. Sure. Big heads and grass carp. <laughs> um, I know that uh, speaking on barometric pressure... I have a small little portable one. Oh yes, that I that I this. used years and years ago when we were fishing, and I know when you and I went out this past year ice fishing. Yep, the barometric pressure was right at thirty. It was right in that green, oh, okay. the good spot. Sure, and it was great all that day long. That was amazing ice fishing. Yes, Walleyes it was. Were biting like crazy that yep. day. Yep, and everyone around us was catching fish. Right. But then I remember we went back like a week later, and it wasn't near as good. Nope, it was falling. Yep. It was falling barometer. The fishing was bad. Yep, absolutely. That ties into it. We were marking mm-hmm. fish, I remember, but they just weren't they biting. Come up. They'd come up to your lure and look at it. Oh, and it was just, go. yeah, very frustrating. Very <laughs> you could frustrating. throw everything down a dang hole and you wouldn't catch them. Yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah, great, great question there. That is a good there. question. Mm-hmm. Um, also on Facebook, Thomas Green would like to hear some good shore or daytime shooting tips. Uh, to me, the best time to do some shore shooting or bank shooting when the fish are spawning for sure absolutely yep that's here in wisconsin okay Mm -hmm. now if you go down to some rivers uh where there's some dams right that's a great spot as well yep those fish will follow those the shoreline to work their way up to the dams 
it's a guidance reference for them as they're swimming. Right. And that's a great spot to go and shoot some big heads, some silvers, uh, spoonbill, you know, or, or other types of rough fish that are in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also what changes that is the flow that's coming through the dams, you know. Right. Um, that makes a big difference as well as where the what level the fish are in. Right. I know when we go down to Kentucky especially, there will be people lined up mm-hmm. on shore shooting fish. Absolutely. And they shoot fish, and they shoot big fish. Yep. You know? Yep. It's not like you got to be in a boat to be successful. Just to go off of that, the best bow fishing day that I've ever had in my life, it was the buff spawn three years ago. We started in a boat, and it got to a point where we're like, we're going to be more efficient just right. walking. Yep. <laughs> we actually got out of the boat and waited. Anyone could have done this, walking off the side of the road mm-hmm. down into the water, mm-hmm. and we were shooting fish like crazy. It was actually more effective to do a, a shore st- you know, right. style, and it was during the day, yep. like he was asking. Mm-hmm. You know, That can be a very effective way to shoot a lot of fish and shoot some big fish too, depending oh. on the time of year. Yeah. What I like to do is get out when they're spawning and just go out there and stand mm-hmm. and wait. Sure. The boat's not there making noise. The trolling board's not making noise. It's silent. The fish don't know you're there because the water is so dirty. Yep. It's turbulent. Yep. Those fish will go between your legs. They'll yep. hit you in the legs. You're like, ooh, you know, boom, yep. they'll take off. But that's when you can wait for the right shot on the right fish. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep, you can wait for that big girl to come on through. Yep, yep. Just one thing to remember is when you're doing that is to have something to tie your tie your fish to because here in Wisconsin, you cannot, you know, shoot a fish and then just throw it back in the water. Right, can't sink it or anything um, like that. Have some kind of a leader or something that you can bring the fish along with. Yep, yeah. yep. I know when we shoot the fish, uh, when we're standing on the ice or on the banks of the ice and where the water's opened up, we'll have those big otter sleds. Oh, sure. And that's where we'll throw our fish and then, you know, bring them back to the trucks and dump them into the beds of trucks that way. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty mm-hmm. effective too. Yep. Yeah. Definitely some good opportunities to be had shooting from shore during the I, day. I, I love the, the, you know, the the bank shooting. And there, Adam Tobiak and a bunch of our friends were just down in Kentucky. Yeah, that's what they were doing. They were shooting offshore. Shooting off the shore, and they were shot some nice big heads yep. down there. Yep, and uh, paddlefish, they were shooting all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff down there. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah, that was very cool. There's some great areas where you can do a lot of bank shooting. Probably the most <clears throat> prominent style that you see is below dams. Yep. Um, and not just in Kentucky, anywhere that there is a dam where there's a river flowing up and coming up to that dam there, that's just a great spot. You'll see people lined up there, you know, quite often shooting right. rough fish. Traps those fish right there and mm-hmm. easy pickings sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So on to the next question here. Scott Brandt asked us on Facebook. This is also, I was reading this and I'm like, ooh, this is a good one to cover. He asked, when thinking of trying a new body of water, what kind of things to, do you use to plan? Example, phone apps, word of mouth, looked good as you drove by. Going off of that question, what do you look for in a body of water while using your preferred method of so-called scouting? He says, hopefully this makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense. Yep. Absolutely. Um, word of mouth is good. Yep. Depending on who you get it from. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. For example here, there is a flowage seven miles from here. Mm-hmm. The big old plain flowage. Yep. There's a lot of pontooners out there. It used to be a really good you know, bow fishing spot, but we had a big kill off, you know, uh, two years back to back, quite a few years back, and they killed a lot of the common carp in there. Yeah. Um, But there's a lot of pond tuners out there, you know, and they're always like, hey, man, you got to get out here, man. Your carp are everywhere. They're splashing everywhere, yep. So I, when I first heard them saying that, boy, I load up and I run out there. Oh, it's back, it's It's back, back. yeah. We get out there and... They're little dinky, yeah. schools of these little dinky carp yep. that were on the surface, you know, with your, and they were really schooled up. Maybe like, you know, 100 in a, in a school, but mm-hmm. they were just tiny little carp. Um, it, so it, word of mouth depends on who you're hearing it from. Um, bass fishermen are, are great. You know, I'll ask fishermen when they come, when I'm at the boat landing, you guys see any rough fish out there? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, didn't see nothing. Right, no. and usually they're pretty good word of mouth they're pretty because good they want those carp out. Absolutely, absolutely. Um Phone apps, absolutely. Oh, they're starting um, to really be a key role in, in scouting, especially when you're in an area that you're not super familiar with. Yeah. I, I love phone apps, um, but I also hate them. Yep, <laughs> yep. I knew <laughs> that was Because when coming. I'm looking at a certain area, I know somebody else can see the same thing. Exactly. Um, but what I do on the phone apps is I'll actually look for something that's a little different, something that's not going to catch everybody's eye. Sure. 
I don't want to look at those spots. We all can look at the back bays. Oh, there's a feeder creek running in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's a big weed line back in that bay right there. We can all see that stuff. It's a stuff that holds fish that people don't really like to look for right. very often. Um, so, so yes, yeah, definitely phone apps, uh, Google Earth, you know, Google Maps yep. are awesome. Um, finding boat ramps that way. There's an app I have on my phone called Navionics, actually, mm-hmm. and it's 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 made for uh, f- regular fishing, but it right. totally translates right over to to bow fishing. It gives uh, real time depth. So that, that, that help, really helps like on rivers and stuff yep. where water might be fluctuating. You can mm-hmm. go in there and look at that. And uh, I know mm-hmm. I use that all the time Yep. when when we'd go out just to, you know, check on things and see stuff. And just back to what you said about not going to the spot that looks, oh, that looks really good, mm-hmm. especially if you're participating in a tournament. Right. You right. might go down there and shoot that spot that looks really good, but you might have to play bumper boats to get back mm-hmm. there and shoot some fish. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. Maybe it's that sand flat out in... 12 feet of water that comes up real shallow that not everyone, you know, looks at, but mm-hmm. you can kind of see a different shade of water in Google, you know, on Google earth that says, Oh, you know, it gets shallow up there. Right. Something like that, right. you know, as a secondary mm-hmm. option. When we were down at the Bass Pro tournament a couple of years ago, and then again, back down for the, um, that world championship down in Missouri, that's when, um, the lakes were like 25 feet above mm-hmm. pool. So we were using our phone apps to look at, to see where fields were. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And if there was a way to get through this wood line to get back to that field that was flooded. Sure. Um, so yeah, we were using maps and a lot, not only looking at water, but looking at when it's flooded, what's back there that we can get to that might be holding fish as well. Right. You know, um, driving by spots. Absolutely. I was coming back from Chicago from competing in a tournament down there years ago in Grass Lake. And we were coming back home through Wisconsin, and we were, went around a, a certain lake, and there was all this reed grass as we were coming around this corner right here. Yep. And the fish were spawning in there like crazy. So what do we do? Yeah. Get out our phone, look at the app. Where's the closest boat landing? There's a boat landing. We went out there, and we just pile drive those sure. fish that Absolutely. one time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That just you uh, driving past seeing that, that could tie into uh, Thomas's question. If you're driving around and you see uh, water splashing, you could also probably stop there and shoot some fish. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know. Yep. Even this year, we got done shooting the Green Bay Tournament. Oh, yeah. And I had been shooting this spot all long because I had scouted and I knew what was in there. And and that night, the fish, there was just too much boat activity in there and stuff like that. So the fish weren't, they went back out deep. But after the tournament, me and John and another guy went back out, went right back to the same spot. We were, I think John's biggest common was 40.1 oh, pounds. Oh, my Lord. But it was incredible, you know. So remember those spots also. Right, right. Um, another thing through to when you're going to scout uh, new buys of water and stuff like that is um, if you've been back to certain areas, you know, you should have spots in your phone or I on your GPS units that. that you have marked and remembered where you had been you know, previously on those spots. Sure. You, you know, you do that for a couple of years. Right. And you have <laughs> you have uh, seven or eight spots on a body of water. Well, then if you have a tournament one night, you can just make a milk run spot to spot to spot. And if it doesn't produce, you know, more than likely one of those spots will hold some fish. And that can make mm-hmm. it a whole lot less stressful the night of the tournament Absolutely. if you have pre-planned spots that you can go hit. Absolutely. You know. You know, but, you know, with scouting... It, Stuff changes so much. Right. Yep. It, it's crazy. I always say we should have tournaments on Thursday and Friday nights. Because when you're scouting, that's when oh, you find yeah. a fish. And then you go back Saturday night for a tournament, uh, and the fish are all gone. Yep. <laughs> yep. All the time at tournaments, you know, we'll be down running a booth or even at the Big 20. You'll ask guys, oh, how's it, how's it looking? Oh, it's we're looking real good. Yeah. With the, we're going to have a 30-pound average if those fish are still there. Yep. Next morning, you're looking around for them. We'll hear they didn't even come then back to Then you come weigh back in. to weigh in. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. That yep. stuff can change. I know that one year for us on the Ohio River, we had big heads up, you know, that were, you could reach out and pet them. Sure. You know? Yeah. So we drove all the way down to, gosh, where was that? Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, geez. It was a bass pro tournament. It's five hour drive. Mm, boy. We drove five hours at takeoff back to the Ohio River to shoot those fish. Never saw a big head. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Never that's, saw a that's big gotta, head. That's gotta hurt a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next question Dustin Lenz on Facebook. 
Where do the big fish go midsummer compared to spring? I find more of them early in the season than I do midsummer. Absolutely. Those fish go to deeper water. Mm -hmm. They go to cooler water. Um, those water temps warm up. They don't like to go lay in that warm water. Um, how often have you seen it where a fish actually buries himself in the mud? You know, those fish are in deeper water. Um, they're in a, that certain thermocline water temperature that they prefer. Yep. Um, springtime, those back bays are cool yet. They're just starting to warm up. They're getting ready to come in to start thinking about spawning. That's why you see all those fish move back into those shallows, you know, in early spring like right. that. Right. Um, even, you know, March and stuff like that, yep. you know, up here. Um, they're moving in because that water is not really warm yet. Now, on the flip side, this is common carp that we're talking about. Now, on the flip side, we always wait for the water temperatures to get really warm down in Kentucky. Oh, sure. For the big heads. You know, we want that water temperature 75, 80 degrees. Yep. When it's just like ugh, muggy and, yeah. and the bugs are out really bad. Uh, their buffs come up really good, you know, when it's like that down sure. there. Sure, sure. Um, but, but here in Wisconsin, I think a lot of the reason that you're not seeing those fish is because a lot of those fish have moved to a little bit deeper water. Now, you can also check different spots in midsummer as well. Um, especially on rivers, spots that have a lot of current. Sure. Yep. They like that. They like that nice cool water that's, that's a constant flow of mm -hmm. cool water and stuff like that. Um, points are also great spots. How many times have you run up on a point and blew out all kinds of fish on that point? You're like, yep. oh, this is a good spot. Yep. Yep. But then you keep working up along that, the shoreline of that point, and there's just not a lot of fish there anymore. Right. Right. Yep. Points are great spots. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, coming up from from deeper, cooler water up onto a little right. bit of a shelf. You right. know, then you get back into the the bay of that point, and yeah, like you said, you don't see as many fish. Mm -hmm. You think you're gonna about to go in there and just rack them up, but mm -hmm. oh, they're only on that point. Well, right. that's because that point is adjacent to deeper, cooler water, especially yep. You know, in the later months of summer around here, at least you know that mm -hmm. July August time frame for sure. Mm -hmm. Weed lines that drop off into the channel. Oh, sure. Work the edges of those weed lines. See if you can push some fish up. A lot of gar like to hang in those areas as well also. Um, years ago, when the big old plane was really good, yep. I was out there one afternoon walleye fishing. And I'm out in the middle with bottom bouncers. And I'm in 15 to 20 feet of water. And these carp were everywhere. Really? On the surface. I could see oh their lips. Gosh. They were like in a way like their lips. I'm like, what the heck are they doing? They were feeding. Yeah. The next night I went back out there. And we shot those fish. Sure. Now, they're a little more spooky to, to get on top of when they're on the surface. Right. Um, if our shadow would hit them, poosh, they would go down. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, you know, late summer. But in the evenings is when that seemed to be the best. Sure. Like, like 4 o'clock to dusk. Yep. It seemed like that was the best. When the water is typically calm, correct? It was windy that one day. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It was windy out there, and they were, like, riding in there. I could see their lips as they were coming from. Wow. I could, I could see, like, several different pods in each little wave that way. I could see their lips coming up out of the water. Wow. That's, yep. that's very cool. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, here's one that Adam Toboyak sent in here. <laughs> he wants to know, how and when did Derek Schmidt get started in the sport of bow fishing? And what's his favorite fish to target? Sure. I definitely have a story behind that question for sure. I actually went to, when I was just a little youngin', just a little fella. A little, little tot. Yep, just a little tot. I went to school with the owners of AMS Bowfishing Son, Sawyer, and I were great friends in school. Still are good friends to this day. And I think it was fourth grade. <laughs> I spent the night at Sawyer's house, and that night, Jeff and Cindy took me out bow fishing. That was the first time I ever experienced. I didn't really know much about it or anything. Nighttime, this is nighttime? nighttime? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. We actually were on the big old plane. We went all up right, yep. fishing there, and I'm like, this is crazy. And we're out there with all these crazy big lights, and I grew up hunting was, was big in the house, and we got these bows, but we're gonna, they're connected to a string, and we're going to shoot fish with them? What the heck? <laughs> this, is, this is just crazy. I remember we were going out there, and, the, like, one of the first fish we saw, Jeff just, he shot it, he nailed it, and he brought it right in. And I remember my jaw must have been on the boat floor once he did it. He took it off, and he put it right in the barrel, and then he re-knocked, and he was ready to go, and I was like, what did I just <laughs> witness? This is insane. Oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And uh, that night, you know, I was, I was just a little fella. I wasn't pulling back much weight. I don't think I got a fish in the boat that night. 
at all. And it was just all small, mm -hmm. common carp at the time. We went out the next day, actually. That's when I shot my first one. Really? Yep. We shot it during the daytime, and I got it in. And I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, I love to hunt and fish, and yeah. bow fishing, you're literally hunting fish. Right, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was very neat. Now, as far as the favorite fish to target. I don't know what that is. Up until my, oh, I don't, I don't know if you do or not. <laughs> <laughs> up until, you know, I was shooting these, these common carp, and then I started working here in high school. Mm -hmm. And I think you took me out. It was me, you, and Tim. We went out one night, and we shot some buffs. That was the first time yeah. I had ever seen a buffalo carp. And yeah. I remember you shot a, a pretty good one, and you brought in the boat. Now, it was unlike anything I had ever mm -hmm. seen before. And then I had I experienced a couple of buff spawns where you just experience, you know, it's just the crazy chaos. You're shooting yep. fish as fast as you can, big fish. Yep. And uh, you're always shooting big buffs. Shot that tank in Kentucky. And so I would have to say today my favorite fish to target would be buffalo. Yep, pure muscle. They're just pure big muscle. tanks, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Um, and just the, the adrenaline rush. And I think another thing is they're tougher to find than – common carp i think around here depending on the time of year when they're not spawning right yeah. when they're not yep. spawning yep. then when they do you're like oh my gosh they're here it, it kind of puts a little bit of a mysterious hue on them a little yeah. bit and then when they're yeah. here you're like oh my gosh you know they're here and they're huge and we're shooting these fish and it's fun so i would have to say adam great question <laughs> big buffs big buffs that's what i figured it was yeah yep that's what yep. I figured it was you know it, it, it getting to the buffs it's so weird you know with our our big mouth buffs here in wisconsin We'll catch them from March until they spawn, which is end of April, 1st of June, yep. you know. Um, but it seems like as soon as those fish get done spawning, they move right back out to deep water. And we don't see them in a lot of lakes anymore until back again in, you know, October and, right. and fall. Right. Um, unlike, I know that some of the buffs down in Kentucky, you know, th those are smallmouth buffs, but they'll come up and feed on the on the pea gravel and sure. stuff like that, where our buffs don't do that here. No. It's nope. so weird. It's so such a weird difference it's, of of the big mouth species. Yeah, it's so crazy know? how a different species like that, and then also the varying states, how much it can totally change your strategy on how you would go about trying to target those right. fish. Right, You know, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, next question here by Mo Leone. He actually messaged us on Facebook, and this is a, this is a good question as well. He said, I'd love to hear a podcast giving pros and cons of different troller types, tiller versus foot pedal versus eye pilot. Maybe even troller versus kicker versus pusher fan. Just a thought, but I'd love to hear more instructional things for some of us with our first boys getting more involved in this great sport. That's Thank you great... so much, and keep up the awesome podcast. That's an awesome, awesome question right there, yeah. Mo. Um, when I first started out in my boat, I had a foot control, all right? So did I. <laughs> and it worked great, but, man, when I got done fishing that night, shooting that night, yeah. My other foot was so sore because yep. all my pressure was on that one yep. foot. Yep. From, you know, controlling the other one. And this one was just bracing myself, basically just kind of standing there. I remember in high school when we bought our boat, we had the choice of buying a used foot pedal or one that was just your traditional, you know, tiller style. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember talking it over with my buddy. I'm like, we should get the foot pedal because then we'll have more you room. Know, ex more room. We'll have all hands on deck when we're ready to shoot a fish. Yep. You know, we'll yep. have, you know, one hand on your, you know, ready to draw, and you, you don't have to worry about holding on to a, a, a tiller at all. But just like you said, we would have to switch every hour or so because our foot would get yep. so sore. Yep, no doubt, no doubt. And I'm not a big fan for bow fishing wise with a remote control, right? Um, trolling motor as well. I just don't, whoops, I just don't like having something on my wrist and I'm controlling it up here. I just don't like that. The best route to go if you're looking at a trolling motor is definitely a hand tiller yep I, I agree yep one that you can move around and it, it just works so easy you can raise them up lower them down you got all the controls right there and as soon as you see the fish you just let go and draw back mm -hmm. and your foot isn't that killing you at the end of the night right right i also feel like you have a little bit more control with your hand than you do trying to put correct pressure on our uh, at least the one that we had our our foot pedal you had to control it and everything with varying pressure of how you push down on your foot right and you're always kind of like oh i know i gotta go this way to turn but then you turn way too hard or you mm -hmm. wouldn't turn enough much that little dial yeah <laughs> yep that was always kind of a, a struggle to yep to to do that mm -hmm. so yep. and then the second part of his question 
troller versus a kicker or a pusher fan? You have a preference on that? Kickers are v- becoming very popular. Mm-hmm. Now. You can cover a lot of ground very fast with a kicker. Um, I've been in a kicker a couple times, and it's nice. You're covering a lot of ground. Um, but, man, I'm telling you what, for my first 10 years of bow fishing was strictly trolling motorboat. Yep. I felt like I could maneuver the boat a lot better. Um, I didn't have as many, you know, you got to, sometimes you're going to have a lot of issues when you have more stuff that you're adding, more motors, more wires, more gauges, more levers, more throttles, all that stuff. You're adding more stuff too. So more stuff can break down. Right. Yep. Um, kickers absolutely have a, a value in bull fishing. Like I said, you can cover a lot of ground, a lot of fast. Uh, you can push fish up, Yep. you know, a lot of fast. You can turn around very quick and easy. Um, you know, right now we have a fan now. Um, and there'll be times when I have the fan on there, but I'll go shoot a tournament and shoot it with a trolling motor. Sure. Yep. I feel like I'm a little more stealthy that way. I can go slower. Um, because, you know, with the fan, the fan's always running. It's right. always pushing you somewhere. Right, right. And um, it's something to get used to. Uh, when you are using a fan um, and the driver that's driving the fan shoots a fish, you know, somebody has to come up there and control it. I know we. Because it's pushing yeah. you. Yeah. Um, what I like to do is when I shoot a fish, if I, if, while I sh- shoot the fish, I'll turn the fan so it takes, keeps us going in a circle right sure. where we are. Kind sure. Of. Unless it's a really big fish and we need to chase it down, right. you know, that way. But then a lot of times also we're filming. So you don't like to hear that motor right. running in the background. Right. A lot. You can kiss your audio goodbye if you got a fan running yep. for sure. I know one that one podcast we did of that back in March when we were shooting fish on the um, when there was still ice on the main lake and we were shooting in the canal there. Yep. We would always, you know, shoot a fish, reach up and turn the motor off. Yeah. You know, so we could talk into the camera. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but no doubt, you know, I I love shooting out of airboats. I think they're awesome. Um, and they're actually when you're shooting fish. They're, they're very quiet, you know. I love the the maneuverability of airboats. You know, you can – I shot in one here a couple weeks ago with um, Josh Knutson in a tournament, and it's just so fun to, to shoot and, and shoot the numbers of fish that you can get up onto, you know, right. and sneak up onto, you know. And this little power can boop, pop you over top of that sandbar or, yeah. or move you across that sandbar with, you know, this much water where – you know, with other stuff, you just can't do that. Even with right. a fan, you can't do that. Right. Not enough know? Not enough gusto behind mm-hmm. you to, to mm-hmm. push you across there. Yep. But it all comes down to personal preference and how much cha-cha-cha-cha-chang yeah. you have. Yep. Yep. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. But, I think situationally, too, you know, there's situations where maybe fish are spooky, then, okay, a, a trolling motor over a... A fan. Absolutely. You know, or if you're shooting a numbers tournament, you want to be in an airboat, you know, just yep. try to get up on as many fish as you can. Mm-hmm. But I think as far as Moe's asking, he's saying that some of his first boys are getting more involved. I think that a trolling motor a trolling would be motor a good way to go with there. With a tiller. Yep. Um, in the front of your boat, that's the way to go. That's going to be the best for you. Um, and along with that, it comes, you know, with certain areas, of course. You know, you got, um, you know, shorelines that have cabins every, houses every... Right. 20 yards, I like to go in with my trolling motor, yep. you know, just to be a little more quiet and I'll move on by through there. Um, but like for Mo, like you said, I think the best thing for him would be a trolling motor with a tiller handle Absolutely. on Absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, Minn Kota 101, you know. Sure. Something like that there. Anyone can control it. You know, it doesn't it yeah. doesn't take a lot of uh, know-how to, to just turn the handle. That way. Right, right. Right. Well, that way. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope that helped you out there, Mo. Mm-hmm. Next question here, Matt. Brian Edwards. Matt, let's hear about the first time you laid eyes on a big head. <laughs> Schmitty, cue the music. <laughs> the first time that I laid eyes on a big head. Oh, this brings back memories. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was a hot, hot, muggy night. Full moon. So romantic. I wasn't shooting, I was filming. Oh. We put it on the Tennessee River. And I was filming Dennis Redden and Jeff and Cindy with AMS bow fishing. Big heads were on a target that night. Mm-hmm. And the setting was just right, it was beautiful. No lights, it was complete darkness. 
except for one little spotlight that Dennis Redden would shine on the water occasionally. And the first time when he shined his lights on that water surface, and I could see these big, beautiful white lips on the surface through the viewfinder, an arrow <laughs> right into that side of that big head. I fell in love. <laughs> I, oh I just fell gosh. in love. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like a, one heck of an experience. Oh. There's nothing like your first time, like they said. I wasn't even <laughs> shooting. I was filming. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's, yeah, that's very cool. But then after that, um, they shot a couple more fish. Um, about midnight, they said, Matt, you want to come down and shoot some? So I jumped on. And yeah, I, I bet you some. were like, uh-huh. <laughs> and yeah. it was. It was. It was love at first sight. Sure. Um, there's just something about going on the rivers at nighttime. Um, no lights, complete darkness, no bugs. Um, you can hear the coyotes off on the shorelines yipping and yapping. Yeah. Um, the barges coming up river to big lights. Um, it's just such a peaceful setting. I just love it. You know, it's just, and then you hear them, you know, you hear mm -hmm. a big boil. You just hear that and you're like, yeah, there's, there's big heads are up tonight, right. you know? And it's just the, the being, the stockiness, I think of it also. Sure. That's the closest thing. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier how you're literally hunting fish. This is like another level. You're yeah. like, you're like spot and stalking big heads in right. complete darkness it's just a different feel very yep. cool yep. though very unique and there's there's times when we'll go out and we wouldn't even we'll see them without the lights because mm -hmm. uh there's a bunch of factories along the river or there's a full moon and you can see you can actually see when they're up feeding really good that top of their lips and you can see that mm -hmm. and you don't even need to shine them with the light you can just wait for them wait for them wait for them let them have it yeah, but no doubt, man. I, I absolutely love my big heads, Brian. <laughs> love them. Mm -mm -mm. Matt's very glad that you asked that question, Brian. <laughs> so, next question here uh, on Instagram, Leanna actually asks us if we have any specific marketing of AMS products for women who bowfish. She says that she loves her AMS reels and arrows. Specific marketing, well, as far as apparel. We used to get um, different types of colors for for the female bow fisher. Yep. And um, we just didn't sell a lot of it. Uh, we had it in stock, but we just didn't sell too much of the, the pink and purple shirts, you know, and stuff sure. like that. Um, but we did, you know, we we did try that for a couple of years there, and these weren't big sellers for us. But then along with that, we've also noticed that there was a lot more female bow fishers over the years getting involved in the Absolutely. sport. Absolutely. Um, they're... They're going with their boyfriends, fiancés, husbands, whatnot. Um, we're seeing a lot of all-female teams yep. in tournaments. Yep, it's awesome to see that. And we also see where there's certain tournaments that are just women-only tournaments. Um, you know, as far as marketing goes, we've got a couple of women on the pro, on the pro staff or social media staff yep. um, that are helping us along with that. Um, um some of those some of those gals will come with us to some shows and and stand there and answer questions or show some of the product along with that as well absolutely um bow fishing bailey is one of them on yep. instagram um so as far as marketing goes we kind of have um and it's not a big staff it's just a, a small social media staff yep. um mary roberts yep out there as well from oklahoma yeah it's awesome to see them out there shooting fish and you know mm -hmm. promoting something that i think started as more of a you know just a bunch of guys would go out and do it and now I, I love that you know over the years there's women shooting in it all the time absolutely you know it's always awesome when you're when we're at the big 20 working and an all women team rolls mm -hmm. up it's like heck yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome mm -hmm. you know that just shows how how big the sport of bull fishing is getting no doubt you know no doubt so and, and just to go off of that i think another interesting thing uh I don't know if this is directly tied to to a lot of women being in the sport, but like I think our second best selling arrow is our pink shaft. Oh no doubt, we, we no sell doubt. A, a ton we sell of those. A ton of pink arrows. And then also I think our, our bows, you know, the hooligan especially, and a lot of bows in the past as well, they're totally universal. Right. You know, guys or or gals can shoot them. The the draw weights and the the draw lengths are so adjustable mm -hmm. that anyone in the boat could could draw it Pick back and, and use it right. at night. So. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's no that's very that. cool. We do have one other Instagram comment on here. Uh, I'm a little unsure on the username, but um, he asked, how does someone become as bow fishing famous as Matthew Schillinger? That's actually a very good question. I'm actually very interested to see. <laughs> <laughs> to see who I didn't get to see really who commented on it, but I did. His profile picture was rather handsome. I will, I will throw that in there. But do you have any, uh, any answer to that question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here's per- a wing. That. The person who commented that was uh, Derek Schmidt Media. I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> <laughs> I had to comment that on there, and I remember I came in the next day. I'm like, did you see all those Instagram comments? And I remember your response. You said, yeah, you wing nut. Yeah. <laughs> Delete that off there. I don't want people I seeing that. that. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, to te- I had to tease you a little bit about that one. Okay, on that question, um, I can remember, like, the very first times that I went to tournaments where Jeff and Sue said, hey, Matt, we want you to go to Illinois to this tournament. Hey, Matt, we want you to go to Worlds in Kentucky. You know, we want you to go here. We want you to go there. Yep. I was so scared. And I was so, I felt so awkward um, because I was pulling around this big old billboard. Yeah. And I felt funny. I felt goofy. I felt, what are people going to think of me when I pull in there? Because I'm not a big ritzy type of guy. Right. All right. I like to talk to people. I like to have a good time. I like to be friends with everybody. And I didn't want them looking at me like I was. And treat you differently. Just And treat me differently right. because I was pulling on the AMS boat. Right. Um, yep. But I felt so funny and so awkward. Um, but I think throughout the years, people have, you know, come along and recognize really kind of who I was Absolutely. and what I was. You know, I, I like to talk with anybody. Right. You know, I like to talk and, and be friendly with anybody. Um, I stay away from from arguments. Right. Not, I don't like to get involved in that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's what's kind of, you know, helped me a little bit throughout the years is just being friendly Absolutely. to everybody and, and helping people and, and, um, a smile on your face, yeah. you know? I think when you, when you think of a lot of guys in the, in the industry that are big bull fishing names, they're all great down to earth. Mm-hmm. Just give you the shirt off their back. Yep. Talk to you yep. about anything and everything kind of guys, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's very cool. Very mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. So I think it is time for this podcast's AMS product highlight. And I think this week we're going to highlight the AMS big game kits. That's right. Gator season is right around the corner. I know mm-hmm. in some spots you can already go out and target gators. Um, public land um, public land or, or private land tags are available right now. But uh, here at AMS Bow Fishing, uh, we have big game kits. And the kits consist of the, the big game retriever which is a little bit different than your standard retriever because it allows you to tie a float to the back of the line. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Consists of two of the floats, three breakaway arrows, and the breakaway arrows are a little bit different than your standard bow fishing arrows because the point is not glued on. All right. It's actually held on with just the string. All right. That way when you shoot your alligator and he takes off, that arrow pulls free, and all you have is a small little hole coming out of that gator's hide right. with just a line in it. Yep. And then once he takes off, he takes all the line off of there, the float pops in, and now you re-rig and you track that float, and you get him closer to the boat again, and you'll shoot him again, get another another float onto that gator, because you're not going to be you know, dispatching of these gators with just your one shot. Right, um, right. You need multiple shots, and then you need to use a bang stick once you get it back up there. Mm-hmm. But we have uh, big game gator kits available for compounds and and um, whatever you shoot. <laughs> Crossbows. Crossbows, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yep. yep. We get the full line readily available. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't need all that stuff, like I said, we have the complete kits that gives you the big game retriever, three arrows, two floats, an extra spool of line. If you don't need any of that stuff, you can also get, you know, just a – a couple arrows right or, or a big game retriever everything that is in the kit we also if you know i don't need the kit we sell it separately as well separately as well in case yep. you need a, yep. a backup or a replacement or something like that's that. right so if you do have a gator tag this year make sure to check out amsboatfishing.com and get your gator gear get it out in practice and send us your pictures of your trophy gators with your ams gear from all of us at ams bow fishing we wish you the best of luck and remember Aim low and think big. Thanks for listening, guys.